You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hey there, David. And hello to all of our listeners out there in Radio Land. Why don't you ever answer me, listeners? <laughs> They're very shy people. Out it's, there. I mean, I mean, it's you know they're they're as their names suggest as their title suggests they're very good at listening yeah you know, they're just that's true they're that that good friend uh, audience i feel like you're always there for me you know you're always you're listening just like a brother and or sister uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah friend zone the podcast audience uh common descent is back for episode five uh, which is very exciting because, as we all know, episode five is the best episode. <laughs> it's it it's we're halfway to double digits is the, always is the way I'm looking at it. That's also true, indeed. This time we are talking about what is probably the most famous event in Earth history. Yeah, that is the end Cretaceous mass extinction, or as it is colloquially known. The Extinction of the Dinosaurs, uh, which is a terribly misleading name for it. But it's what it's known for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about why that is not a very good name for yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but this is this was a one of the, the biggest extinction events uh, that the world has seen, and certainly the most famous one. This is, this is the extinction event everyone learns about first, and what you think of when you hear the term mass extinction. Yeah, like, exactly. There's been a bunch. There's been a lot more than most people realize, but this is the one that your mind goes to. Yes, it is. But before we do that, let's go right ahead and do some news. Welcome to the news. Welcome to the news. Well, this this episode, the, the news segment is called Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> Sponsored by... Uh... <laughs> In 87, Huey released this for their most accomplished album. Would you like to start us off? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, all right. So my first one uh, is this, this one's a really fun one. Just it's a new look at uh, another one of those big studied moments. Uh, it is Ooh. a news article uh, on a research that's suggesting that eye development of eyesight was most was either the main or one of the more heavily driving factors to pushing the first fish onto land. Oh. And so... Very cool. Early fish, uh, toward j just under 400 million years ago, started moving onto land, the, the famous one being Tiktaalik. Mm -hmm. That was the first. That that is often considered the first of those early ans uh, tetrapod ancestors that we found. Yeah, they have. It's been debated off and on, and tried to figure out why did they come on land? Because it's right. You know, it's a common knowledge. We everything came from the sea. We eventually came on land. But why? Why leave the sea? Which your fins are way better for. Yeah. That area. <laughs> it's. It's their strong suit, and a lot of things have been thrown around that there is more food, you know, potentially that they weren't, you know, were able to get to up there. The free right. space, you know, there was less competition now that you were going into a mostly empty area from at least for things your size and like you. Yep. Uh, but uh, scientist uh, Malcolm McLever, mm -hmm. uh, who I believe he was a neuroscientist, uh, is his background. Interesting was looking at fossils for early tetrapods and their fish ancestors. And he noticed that the eyes were getting perpetually bigger before they ever made it to land. Uh, Interesting. So in the lineage leading up to those first land-walking fish, yes. the eyes were already changing. Hmm. And continuing into those first land-exploring fish, it also increases, and then with those first true early tetrapods. Hmm. And the it's kind of a, a couple of things that he thinks drove this process. The first being that as life was going, you know, becoming more common on land, it was indeed a food source. But they probably started to see it from the water of things falling on the surface. You know, lots of fish that you know hunt those insects or hunt on the you know shore for things. And it's shown by the fact that the eyes start to move to the top of the skull. So they were looking. Okay. Up. Like a crocodile. Like a crocodile. And that was actually the exact comparison they make. 
is that you start to you first start seeing them look up, and then on Tiktaalik they actually periscope up a little bit to where now the eyes are visibly on top of the head raised up and has a long snout so it was very likely ambushing just like a crocodile at the surface interesting so the idea here being that instead of you know you know before the fish actually started hopping around mud skipper style mm-hmm. on the land many of them had evolved this trait that allowed them to peek out of the water at the land environment where exactly. we should mention that bugs and plants and stuff made it up there before vertebrates did. Absolutely. So there was lots of potential food there. Mm. And part of the reason that they think this was such a big deal, the vision, is that light travels a lot less uh, efficiently in water. Oh, okay. Light travels, you know, blue light travels farthest. Most other spectrums of light start to fade. So Mm -hmm. there's lots of sea animals have secondary sensories that that are often their main sense organ for hunting underwater. I mean, you can see that in lots of animals where sight is not their keenest sense right. because they can feel the vibrations, they can sense the electricity, they can use sonar. And then sight is for the final kill. Seeing in water, you have much less distance, much less clarity compared to once you go into air where light travels much better and much farther right. and much faster. And I, I understand also that the visual system that you need to see effectively through air is different than what you need to see effectively through water. Yeah. So there was a transition that had to happen in the sensory systems. But you, you can even see uh, some animals today that do that. Like, there's sharks that will peek their head above water to get a glimpse of what's going on on, cool. you know, on the surface. Great whites are shown doing that because they hunt animals living at the surface. Uh, cool. and so they'll peek up to see, are the pups born yet on the beach? And then come back down. Uh, That's cool. So it, they think that they were likely doing stuff like that, where they poked out, were suddenly able to see better, see more food, and then that started to drive that, where they now had vision on the surface was an advantage. And then the coolest thing that they think came from this is that once they were on land and they now had a longer distance vent vision, they could hunt. you could now aim to hunt prey farther away. It wasn't just the one you found closer up, you could now see the prey you wanted to go get. And they think that drove the more higher intelligence of many of the land-based animals. And, of course, as they were eventually leading to us, because that's... Right, yeah. That's Tetrapods. what matters. <laughs> all right, yeah, that's the important part, is the end of the story. <laughs> but <laughs> the fact that now you could see ahead, literally see ahead, you could also... Mm-hmm. the Or not so much that you could, the ability to plan ahead became more important. To actually be able to ambush your prey, or you know, you could see it, you know, hundred feet away now. So you needed to be able to figure out by the time I get there, what am I going to do? You know, those yeah. things, and it drove a higher intelligence along with that vision. The the concept of pre-adapted traits, uh, which is another misleading term, yes. but the idea that in this case, the the suspicion here being that these organisms evolved the ability to see th- better through the air for peeking at things on land, either because they were going to wash in or they would jump up and grab it and then jump back down or whatever, mm-hmm. was a trait that was in place by the time whatever the full suite of selective pressures was came about that sort of encouraged that land invasion. Mm-hmm. So by the time it, you know, is oh, we found all these different reasons to go on to land, and hey, we already evolved the eyesight that we need and perhaps some of the hunting strategies that we need to take advantage of now that we're up here. It's really, really cool. And that that is a fun subject. Just animals that, by coincidence or by convenience, already have a, a, a feature that once they get into someplace new or something changes, they're like, oh, well, I, you know, mountaintop animal already have a fur coat for this ice age coming up. Uh, yep. And it's pretty cool. This one is neat. Because they were they were able to track it in the skulls and show eyes just getting bigger and bigger and moving. So they were focusing more and more on sight, which was very cool. It was uh, they have some really good images, so that link will definitely be in the blog post. Cool, that's right. fun. My first uh, piece of news is actually also a fish fossil hey. and also a transition. And this one took me by surprise because being a uh, tetrapod slash reptile aficionado as I am, I don't know a lot about fish. Mm-mm. 
So this is a fossil that comes from Canada, from the early Devonian period. So around that same time, actually, you know, around 400 million years, maybe a little earlier than, than the fish you were talking about. Mm -hmm. This is a fossil about what might be one of the earliest shark ancestors or the earliest sharks. So at this time, there were a bunch of different groups of fish swimming around in the ocean. You had the placoderms, which were covered in armor. You had the earliest chondrichthys, which are sharks and rays. Mm -hmm. You had the earliest bony fish, or early representatives of bony fish. You even had the, the, the bone-finned fish, which are the ones that would ultimately give rise to us tetrapods. And you had this group called the spiny, the spiny fish, or, or some variation on spiny fish, the acanthodians. And these are, are fish that were characterized in part by having these spines on their fins and on their skin. Mm -hmm. But the relationships of the acanthodians have always been a little bit unclear. They are completely extinct now. They were only Paleozoic, and so all we have to go on is their fossils. As it turns out, the origins of sharks are also rather unclear. Oh. Similar to, uh, we were talking about snake origins. Mm-hmm where the fossil record is just not very forthcoming on that. Well, this is a fossil that was actually found several years ago called Doliotus problematicus, uh, <laughs> which really tells you what <laughs> how scientists have, have been dealing with it. <laughs> when you let your <laughs> feelings out on the name of your fossil. Yep. This is a basically a follow-up to some other studies that have been done on this fish that are essentially showing that it's jaw structure and its skeletal structure around its fins are very shark-like. You know, sort of characteristic what you see in sharks. Yeah. But it has the acanthodian spines on the fins, on the skin, so it has features that are characteristic to both groups, and it comes from a time period that is after the first acanthodians had already shown up, the first spiny fish, mm -hmm. but around the time that sharks and their relatives should be getting going. So it's right so in that sweet it, spot. Yeah. So what it looks like is this lends strong support to a hypothesis that sharks evolved from this group of spiny fish. That's cool. That they are actually the ancestral group to sharks and rays, the cartilaginous fish. Very cool. Which is super neat, and it is a perfect. If that's if that ends up being the case, as mm -hmm. they continue to study, this will this is a transition fossil. Yeah, that holds on to features from the ancestor and has started developing features that we now associate with the descendants, which are sharks. It's about as perfect a textbook case as you can get. Um, yeah, where it it's almost half and half, <laughs> and that's yeah pretty awesome. It's also cool that it would have been a shark with spines and spikes coming off of it <laughs> <laughs> yes just I don't know as a side note but <laughs> yeah i don't really know the extent or the size of the spines uh, on the different species uh, among acanthodians i know the sizes but... i'm imagining in my head <laughs> <laughs> and that's all that matters that's really you know if i that's what my paleo art will show um <laughs> it's like in the old speed racer cartoons where the wheels would have the spines just come out of them, the two sharks <laughs> swimming alongside each other in the ocean. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a it's a quick one, and it's a cool example of not only a transitional fossil, but of a field again, like when we were talking about snakes, as some species, some groups of of life, we don't know much about their origins, and it's always really exciting to find a new fossil that fills in a little bit of that space. Absolutely. And and sharks are one of those to begin with because of how they fossilize. There's typically not much to a shark fossil because the hardest parts are the teeth. And yep. after that, unless you get really rare situations, not much else sticks around. Uh, yep. So there's been, oh, there's been tons of weird sharks that have shown up where we've been able to tell they were weird, but we didn't know how the weird part fit in <laughs> until... A lot later when we finally found yeah. that one perfect fossil. But we'll just have a tooth. I have no clue how it's using this thing because this is all we have. Yep. And so sharks <laughs> have had those mysteries throughout their history just because of how they fossilize. Yeah. The cartilaginous fish. Yeah. No surprise. Don't leave a whole lot of fossils of their bodies. The softer you are, the, the harder it is for us to learn about your past is kind of the way this it goes. <laughs> yep. 
All right, so so my next one is much, much younger. Uh, it's a pretty quick one, but I had to report on it just for the principle of it. Of it course. is the oldest croc eggs uh, yeah. yet discovered, uh, which is cool in and of itself. Uh, they are, they yep. were really well-preserved eggs, uh, and they, the, artic- the actual study goes re- way in-depth about how the eggs fossilize, how other crocodilian eggs have fossilized in the past, and so on and so forth, and which I love to sink my teeth in when I once I have the time to actually go through all that data. Yeah. But this one's about 152 million years old, uh, late Jurassic, which puts it at about 40 years older than any other previously known croc egg. Okay. Uh, 40. So we're adding 40, 40 million. million yeah, 40 million yeah. years. Uh, 40 years. Yes, yeah, 40 years. I bet you didn't think that we could date things that. We precisely. now know what was the oldest. We now have its grandfather. <laughs> And uh, surprisingly, uh, crocodilians do pass down family names. Um, no. Oh, well, there uh, you go. <laughs> it had it actually had a family picture. Yeah, next uh, to the eggs. It had the. are going to be named the, after it had your the, uh, the uh, photo album, and it had the family tree in front of it. And this was uh, Man, Croc talk about George. rarity of fossilization. <laughs> you never find those. <laughs> well, you can tell which one's the grandfather because it has a little mustache and uh, glasses and hands sitting at the head high. of the table. Uh, whew, I said this was going to be a you fast should, one. I just talked over that joke. I hope that people heard it because you said the pants are pulled way up. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All, All right. right. Uh, so backtracking, I, I originally said uh, 40 million years old. We're all going to pretend like we edited it that way. Uh, <laughs> so about 40 million years uh, that would be four tens of millions of years older than the previously <laughs> oldest fossil. These were, uh, they think they had two different species from the ones they found. Mm-hmm. And they range in size of a max about six feet long, just a couple of meters. So not, not nothing crazy big. Yeah. But probably one of the most interesting things about it is that it was found in a dinosaur nest. Or, or at oh. least among material from a dinosaur nest. <laughs> Interesting. There's a, a a nest that they've been excavating for quite some time, and these were found in it. Uh, they're very similar to modern eggs, which suggests that they are uh, croc ancestry has been laying eggs about the same way for a long, long time. Uh, now these were crocodilian morphs. So going back to our right. croc episode, these are relatives and cousins and ancestors of modern crocodilians. And crocodilians are within crocodilian morphs, but these are slightly different. Uh, right. So they could have looked vastly different from what we see today they're not sure why it was in they were among the dinosaur eggs in the nest yeah it could mean a number of things the first thing it brought to my mind and i'm not making any accusations that this is the case but we see this with some monoreptiles today because turtles will lay their eggs within alligator nests huh female turtle will wait you know pregnant mother wait till the mom gator goes off to eat because the mom gators protect it basically 24-7, but at some point they do have to eat during the few months right, that the right. eggs are incubating. Once she slips off for just a moment, the turtle has to run in, push her way into the nest, mm-hmm. just bulldoze her way in, lay her eggs, and then get out before mom gator gets back. Uh, Interesting. And then the turtle eggs are timed to hatch about the same time as the baby gators. Cool. So that when it's time for the mother to bring them out, and it's... Old documentary I saw way back when I was a kid, but it is fantastic. The turtles hatch about the same time, and Mom Gator comes back to dig out the babies, and she's in mom mode. Like t- uh, crocodilians yeah. go into almost a kind of a trance when it comes to these reproductive moments. When they egg lay, you can get right up next to them because they are clo- blind to the world, and in huh. that maternal moment, actually picked up some of the baby turtles and carry them down to the water as well. That's fantastic. Because it's just another little crawly thing in her nest, and she's not differentiating. Uh, Interesting. But by, even without that added, you know, storybook ending, uh, (laughs) there's no safer place for your eggs to be when it comes to nests than a mother alligator's nest. Yeah. Like, they do get raided, but uh, compared to a songbird nest, there's not nearly as many things they need to get through, which makes me wonder if we're seeing a similar thing, but now a step up to where croc crocodilomorphs were using some big dinosaur as a place That's to protect cool. their ne- eggs. But it's it's a really cool thing. It teaches a whole lot about what 
the eggs were like and how consistent it's been and raise more questions. They, they also were found in Portugal, just to give a place on the map. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Those are always fun little discoveries to make. I love it. It's, it's, everyone listening can be prepared for it. doesn't matter how small it is. If it mentions Croc in the title, that news will be at the front. <laughs> There's a bias going on here. It is it is just, I feel it is under, underrepresented. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to do my part. Well, the next story that I have, our final news piece, is breaking with biases probably more than any other news story that we've talked about so mm-hmm. far. Uh, I think that this is probably the oldest fossil that we've discussed. Yes. Uh, as well as the least reptilian <laughs> by a by a long by a long margin it's, it's a it, almost as far away as you can get <laughs> <laughs> so these are fossils of what might be the earliest members of the plant lineage these are from india and they are about 1.6 billion years old so for some context you know the first animals show up around a billion years estimated. Mm-hmm. They first start really making their way into the fossil record at maybe 600 million years ago. So when the first multicellular complex celled organisms show up in the fossil record has been a really big question for a really long time. Mm-hmm. Because not only the farther back in time you go, is there less chance you're going to find good fossils? But these we're talking about microbes. Yes. And so they're very difficult to find, but there are there is an entire field, subfield of micropaleontology looking for fossil single-celled or few-celled organisms. Searching for early life. Yep. So these are really interesting because not only are they 400 million years older than the previously oldest accepted plants, these are uh, identified as red algae. Not only does their cellular, you know, they're the size to be algae, but they also, you know, one of the characteristics of complex cells. So there's two types of cells. You've got your prokaryotes, Mm -hmm. which are bacteria and such, and you've got your eukaryotes, which are protozoans plus plants, fungi, and animals. Everything else. Everything else. Us. Eukaryotic cells are not only bigger, but they're more complex. Mm -hmm. They have these little more organelles inside of them uh, of a particular structure. They have nuclei. These cells are not only similar in size and structure to eukaryotic cells, but they have bits within them that look like part of plant photosynthesis systems. Oh, cool. The kind of organs, organelles that you see within algae and plants. And so they identify these as red algae. There are two different species. One of them as filamentous in structure, and another one kind of groups in sort of blob-like mm-hmm. little colonies, which makes these, if correct, what might be the oldest definite fossils of multicellular eukaryotes. Which is interesting because it not only pushes back the fossil record of eukaryotes, but matches decently well with estimates of when the first eukaryotes would have evolved. Oh, that's cool. So we might be looking at some of the first eukaryotic cells, especially eukaryotic multicellular Mm -hmm. organisms, and in this case, some of the first members of the blossoming, so to speak, plant lineage. (laughs) Very cool. Yeah, so the origins of multicellularity uh, are hinted at here with these new fossils uh, from India, which, which is, is really, it, it's all, it just, just really blows my mind to think about people who specialize in studying cellular fossils. Well, it's, it's not only are cellular fossils crazy to begin with, but when you're going that far back, it is, you know, Every jump in time you go back adds a new layer and factor of complication or difficulty. Because not only are multicellular less likely to fossilize and going to be hard to make sure you find when they fossilize because they're tiny. Mm -hmm. But 
if when you're going back, we're not dealing with just hundreds of millions. We're dealing with billion years. Yes. <laughs> we are now doing a new bracket of counting. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, even if something did fossilize, it could have fossilized and been destroyed by the time oh, yeah. we get to... So in that amount of time... And then on top of that, it brings in the difficulty of what if it gets fossilized and then pushed up by a mountain or thrown up by a volcano or washed over by a flood or a glacier or and it could have been moved around five times in the billion years since yeah, it died. And so that adds all these new questions and that's you know, the article mentioned that you know, just about every article that deals with when it talking about the earliest form of a thing. Is the mm-hmm. fact that there's always great debate on, is it? You know, are we sure that this is what we're looking at? Are we sure we're right. not looking at something weird? That something weird didn't happen, but you know that with what we're looking at, because it's you're now dealing with something a vast distance in time away from us. Yeah, this this is um that age puts it squarely in the Proterozoic, mm-hmm. which is before the Cambrian explosion, well before most recognizable things are on the planet, everything is either single-celled or tiny multi-celled as far as we know. And it's a it's a huge, mysterious time. Because uh, there's just, you know, like you said, the farther back you go, the harder it is to find good fossils. Mm-hmm. It, this is very similar to when uh, astronomers look through at another galaxy and zoom in on a star and say, we think it has planets. This is, <laughs> yeah. We're dealing with the same thing as now you are dealing with such great distances and differences. I read this article before we started. And the thing that blew my mind was when they went, you know, this is red algae, which we're pretty sure is a plant. And <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing is that it's, if it's not a, if it's either a plant or it's a very, close cousin to plants. And so you get into some really weird stuff like that when you find those truly old fossils. Like, this is before, you know, certain groups of life existed. So you might not be able to place it within one of those groups well because it might be its own thing that now no longer is around that is truly alien. It's interesting because red algae is is still around. So mm-hmm. if they're correct on their identification, this is a group of plants or close to plants that have been around for a long, long time. They're considered to be one of the first groups of plants, regardless of where these fossils fit in. And even if not one of the first complex life with this yep. fossil. Uh, and which is today cool. they're mostly seaweed. Yeah, it's the yeah, they're, sushi they're, seaweed. Yes, it is. Uh, it's very simple compared to the plants that we're used to up here on land. Yeah, it's that one. That one was very cool, just because of the the vastness of what it was dealing with. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 fun to talk about. You know, oh, this is the origin of sharks, and this represents yeah. the origin of land dwelling vertebrates. <laughs> like this represents the origin of. All plants, <laughs> which is very close in relation to the origin of all animals. This is one of the oldest things we have, period. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty It's pretty cool. Now, it should be mentioned just to defer to the microbiologist out there that this is one of the earliest examples of a eukaryotic organism. Prokaryotes, oh, yeah. bacteria were around for at least two billion years before this. They were doing fine. Which is really, really another whole thing to talk about, is the fact that life started way before what we recognize typically as life eventually showed up. (laughs) And that's a whole other episode uh, to get into the really earliest stuff. So this is how we end everything. But that's a tale for another day. That's Uh, a tale (laughs) for another time. You'll have to by the next episode that <laughs> that episode is dlc how they get you <laughs> yeah. um but we're not here today to talk about the originations of things <laughs> no today's episode we are talking about death doom and gloom so let's talk about mass extinction it's a it's a it's probably one of the uh flashier of all of the paleontology subjects 
Yes, it is. And it's extraordinarily relevant today. Yeah. <laughs> so, intro to Extinction. Extinction, as sad as it sounds, is a regular part of life through time. Yeah. Species go extinct on a fairly regular basis. Uh, depending on what group of organisms you're looking at, or if you're looking at everything, you're going to get, spe- you know, a, f- a decent, regular number of species extinctions every year, decade, millennium. But every now and then, throughout the history of the planet, we have time periods where extinctions happen in great number in a geologically short amount of time. There are a few cases, right? There's a lot of mass extinctions that are localized or minor. Yeah. You know, like an island might experience a mass extinction just on the island. One group of animals, you know, one one yeah. lineage will experience it on a continent where, you know, the marsupials get wiped out from one right. area. But there have been a handful of times in Earth history where we have experienced global mass extinctions on such a scale that we actually rank them. <laughs> uh, you may have heard of the Big Five. Yeah. These are five examples of mass extinction that, typic- by traditional classification, took out at or more than about half of life on the planet. The yeah. end Cretaceous mass extinction is one of those. In fact, by most ranking systems, it's the second worst one. Yeah. It's significant. Yeah. It, 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 it's a big deal. <laughs> Now, commonly called the extinction of the dinosaurs, uh, misleading for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, dinosaurs have been evolving and going extinct for a long, long time before mm-hmm. this. Second of all, some dinosaurs made it. But most significantly, calling it the extinction of the dinosaurs makes it seem like it was a dinosaur-specific event. Absolutely. And it wasn't. And, uh, and you see that in the way it's talked about. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I can't count how many times I've seen things like dinosaurs, an evolutionary dead end, or, and the dinosaurs finally lost out, or, you know, they they just couldn't hack it. And it's always portrayed that the world kept spinning and every single dinosaur just went, and just passed out. And all the other animals were like, oh, that was weird. Yeah, I don't know what happened to those guys. (laughs) That is not the case. (laughs) Somewhere in the vicinity of 70 to 80% of life on Earth is estimated to have gone extinct at this time. Yeah. So for some details, you know, this event happened uh, roughly 66 million years ago, Mm -hmm. based on the the best dating that we have. This event is so apparent in the fossil record that it is that layer where you have a bunch of cool things that are alive, lots of diversity, and then the next layer up most of it's gone, that marks the end of the Cretaceous period and the Mesozoic era. Mm -hmm. The age of dinosaurs ends at this layer. There's, in some areas, a literal, you can see the divide of the line with where those two separations are. Yup. It's the end Cretaceous extinction, or the KPG. Mm -hmm. Uh, K for Cretaceous, PG for Paleogene, which is the next uh, period. You'll you'll still see in some things the KT extinction, which yes. is using a older term for that next area, which is the tertiary. But that's yes, no longer the the modern usage. We're gonna keep up with the times. Yeah, call it the KPG. We're we're hip <laughs> to the modern <laughs> lingo. You guys are really missing out for the fact that, that you was, can't uh... see. That the was bad an Austin Powers movies. reference, but it probably doesn't come across quite as well with just the... Without my bad cabbage patch. <laughs> without the hip swinging. Uh. <laughs> so what happened at this extinction? Some groups of life did in fact disappear entirely. The flying pterosaurs completely disappeared at this boundary. The mosasaurs and the plesiosaurs, the big aquatic reptiles, disappeared. Uh, the spiral-shelled ammonites with their squid faces, completely died out. Even the groups that made it most suffered significant losses. Lizards and snakes took hits, turtles suffered losses, crocodilomorphs suffered some big losses, Uh, plants, insects, just about every group of life felt this extinction event to varying degrees. Even mammals, even birds, who were traditionally depicted as like 
you know, oh, they bravely made it across, you know, with dinosaurs toppling around them, birds and mammals just happily skipped across the KPG boundary. The, the underdog just came out clean as yeah. a whistle. Not the case. Mammals, especially the marsupial lineage, suffered some big losses. Birds almost <laughs> went completely extinct. Which isn't surprising. Every, yeah. Every group of dinosaurs died out, including, you know, there were four or five major families of birds at this time, and only one of them made it through, and not even all of them. So birds came very, very close to to disappearing entirely along with the rest of the dinosaurs at this boundary. Exactly why some things, you know, why did birds make it? That is a different episode. <laughs> we're going to talk more about what happened. Absolutely. That's too, too many questions with too many possible answers. <laughs> this, this event is honest. This is one of the most de- in-depthly studied events in Earth history. Absolutely. The literature for this event goes on forever. There's multiple documentaries. Yep. And this event is so significant that it was recognized well before we had any idea of a cause for it. Mm-hmm. But there are some hints in the patterns of extinction that we see as to what happened. Yeah. So very famously, large species suffered a lot more than small species. Mm-hmm. Um, across all different groups of animal life, specialists suffered more than generalists. Which is almost always the case when extinctions yep. come around. And these both make sense, because yeah. an extinction is a time of lowered resources. Mm-hmm. The bigger you are, the more you need. Yep. And if you specialize in a particular kind of food, you're yeah. out of luck. Anything happens to that food, you got nowhere yep. else to go. You don't get to be picky in the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is this is interesting because fish, mammals, insects, all different groups have shown this specialist disappeared, generalist did better. Yeah. Another really interesting trend is that herbivores and carnivores suffered more than scavengers and detritivores. Oh. So if you were a creature that swam, you know, scuttled on the bottom of the ocean picking up scraps, mm-hmm. you went ex- you suffered comparatively less extinction mm-hmm. uh, in general than animals that were more directly dependent on the traditional food web. Yeah. And this is a really interesting bit of evidence because this gets at the answer to what causes mass extinction, mm-hmm. right? Asteroids don't just fall and land on everybody's head and they die and that's yeah. the extinction. It's not that it's not that it blew everyone up. <laughs> yes, extinctions happen when ecosystems collapse. Mm-hmm. Plants suffered, and so herbivores suffered, and so carnivores suffered, and the further the closer you were the more dependent you were on that central core of the food web, the harder you were going to be hit. Yeah, and the, the more you know, more rigid you were. You know, yep. just, it, the fewer options you had, the, the more trouble it caused for you. Yeah. Not to mention that being a scavenger in a time of mass death probably is also not oh, yeah. a terrible place to be. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Christmas every day. <laughs> Uh, one of the other really interesting trends is that freshwater ecosystems did better than terrestrial or marine ecosystems. Very interesting. Which is weird. Yeah. Because we tend to think of streams and lakes and rivers as pretty um, fragile. Yeah, or fleeting. Yeah. You know? But the explanation that I've heard for this is that what might what may have happened is terrestrial ecosystems are built on plants. Mm-hmm. And aquatic ecosystems are built on photosynthetic algae and cyanobacteria and such. But a lot of stream, river-type ecosystems, the bottom of their food chain tends to be junk that comes from the land. Yeah, just things that get washed in and washed down. Yep, and insects and stuff like that. So those weren't ecosystems that were, you know, they were detritus-based to a degree that allowed them to to weather this event better. Yeah, they were already scavenging in nature. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. So this was a big event. Everybody felt it, but it wasn't random. Mm -hmm. There were patterns as the ecosystem collapsed to what sort of extinctions we saw and to which groups survived and which didn't. 
it should be mentioned before we we finish up the the patterns of the extinction that people always want to know you know oh why did birds make it but pterosaurs didn't and why did you know the little mammals make it but the little dinosaurs didn't and this and that and the answer to that question really is there's partially going to be lots of different factors and one of those factors is luck yeah it's very hard to say there's always the random fact yeah so it you know birds may have gotten lucky mm-hmm. or there may have been something special about them that let them just sneak by yeah and that, that's that's always a, a big thing is when something this large happens there's so many complex nuances going on between yep. uh what what is each animal doing where are they living how is that area getting affected because it could just be as simple as well that continent just didn't get hit as hard and yep. there was enough of that kind of animal there to eventually repopulate the world you know yep. it's it, there you you can never plan out every single thing uh yeah it's a, that's where the chaos theory gets into it is once a <laughs> situation gets complex enough there's now too many variables yeah, like very hard to predict. Mm-hmm. You drop and there water is on your definitely. And... <laughs> yep. Did I go too fast? I went too fast. <laughs> so the rest of this episode is going to focus mostly on why did the extinction happen, which is one of the biggest questions uh, that everybody wants to know the answer to. Absolutely. Like I said, we knew about the extinction long before we had any really solid evidence for a cause. And that's why, especially earlier books and things, you see all sorts of different answers to this question. One of the the most interesting things that I've noticed is when you talk to people, you see this on, you know, in classrooms and on TV and in books and such. There's this mentality that we're still guessing, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit outdated. Yeah. Yeah, there's this mentality that we're still trying to guess it at what did it. And that's not quite the case. No. We know what happened. We actually have some very good evidence to tell us what happened at this time. We don't know, because there were a few things happening, exactly how they interacted with each other and exactly how they factored into the extinction. Like it, it's kind of uh, very much like when we talked about the megafaunal extinctions uh, mm-hmm. you know, right around the Ice Age of, was it changing climate or us being jerks that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> both of these were happening. We, the climate was undeniably changing. We are undeniably jerks, <laughs> yep. which drove the final nail in the coffin or which started building the coffin. Right. And what, how do they interact? This is a similar case. There were two major things happening at the KPG boundary. One, an asteroid hit the planet. Mm -hmm. Big one. And two, India was exploding. Just a bit. With some really intense volcanic activity. These two events also happened on a background of some longer-term events, such as changes in sea level. Mm -hmm. So we have a few different things going on that were certainly big deal enough to be involved in this extinction event, coincided with the extinction event, and what the debate is, and there is still plenty of debate about this, yeah. was one of them the big thing? Where did it? Was it all a, a cooperative effort? Would the extinction have happened if only one of these things happened? So let's work our way through the various things that were happening at the KPG boundary. Yeah. Starting with the, 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 the famous one, the place where you have to start. Yeah, this is typically what you hear if, if you just do a, a basic Google search what killed the dinosaurs, this is the answer that comes up. This is it. You get asteroid. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of reason to suspect this. Yeah, Lilo and Stitch even makes a joke about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Life has you to start on uh, this planet every time they get hit by an asteroid. Ultron talked about it, too. That was his whole thing. Yeah, exactly. He's gonna, gonna use a, I think he calls it a meteor, which is technically not... No. Meteors burn up in the atmosphere. He didn't know what little people were called, so... He, <laughs> this is true. He didn't, he didn't even know. <laughs> Probably one of my favorite line of that movie. Uh. <laughs> so, at 66 million years ago, an asteroid hit the planet. This is known very well. Yes. That layer that Will mentioned before, that KPG layer, mm-hmm. is made up of iridium and other elements that you see in asteroids. 
shocked quartz, which is a mineral formed during impacts, tektites, which are cooled droplets that you see coming off of impacts. It's, just that it's raining earth. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we have a crater. Mm-hmm. In the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, it's buried under millions of years of sediment, but there is a very distinct crater, and it's not, this isn't a little crater. It's so it is about somewhere around 120 miles across. This was a major, major impact. And the crater and the layer date to the same time. Mm -hmm. They form the boundary of the late Cretaceous. So we know an asteroid hit. We know where it hit. The estimates for the size of the asteroid put it at 10 kilometers or 6 miles across. Jeez. <laughs> which, for comparison's sake, is the height of Mount Everest. <laughs> that is, if you put it down on the ocean floor, it would be an island. Yeah. Because the ocean's not that deep. <sighs> this was big. It, this is a big rock. It, it's one, it, it, This is one of those, uh, aptly for Ultron, this is one of those like comic book or video game things where they just start yeah. throwing out big numbers, you know, <laughs> yep. where they're just saying in a movie, it's like, oh, it's six miles long and it's going to make a crater the size of you. And it's one of the, and it just yep. sounds ridiculous, but it, these are all legitimate measurements on how this... ridiculous this impact was. Yep. And the effects are suitably proportional. <laughs> Apocalyptic. Yeah. So the immediate effects of the impact, and these are things that come out of geologic evidence, mm -hmm. as well as simulations. So impact happens, big explosion, meteor gets v uh, the meteorite gets vaporized, as does the rock that it hits. The impact would have created really significant seismic activity, and there is evidence through in the geologic record for landslides, you know, collapses of the continental shelf, as mm -hmm. well as tsunamis. Mm-hmm. Really big tsunamis. Yeah. Which would have extended across, you know, around the Gulf of Mexico region. So locally, there would have been some really intense earthquakes and tsunamis. Mm -hmm. The most devastating immediate effect would be the debris. Now, it's tempting to think, okay, giant rocks falling down on the earth and crushing dinosaurs. And sure, that would have been a thing. Yeah. But the big problem was that you've now shot up tons of rock into basically suborbital altitudes, mm -hmm. and then they're going to start coming down, but as they re-enter the main part of the atmosphere, they start burning up. Yep. So you have approximately 10 or 20 bazillion pebble and crumb-sized pieces of rock all burning in the sky at the same time. Mm-hmm. Simulations indicate that this would have created a heat pulse, and I quote one of my favorite lines from an article from an actual scientific paper about this: "Estimated temperatures similar to a domestic oven set to broil." <laughs> yeah, that was bad. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of those moments where it can't even wrap your mind around what that would look like. How, how does that even actually look? Yep. The sky would have just lit up. Now, what is debated about that is how long were those temperatures sustained? Were they the same? You know, how did cloud cover or weather yeah. or vegetation affect it? So whether or not this, you know, it probably didn't heat blast every living thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. But at least in some places, probably lots of places, things died from heat. There would probably have been at least a bit of fires set. Yeah, forest fires. In, yeah. These effects would have gone on for, you know, hours to days. Mm -hmm. Debris, and especially the tsunamis and earthquakes, you know, lingering effects for, you know, the first few hours, the first few days, perhaps. Once that stuff settles, what's left is all the rest of that dust that didn't settle immediately. Yeah. And the vaporized meteor dust is going to be very sulfurous. Mm -hmm. Lots of gases like that, which not are not only are those going to create some acidic rain, yeah, but they're dark. They reflect sunlight. 
which means while that soot is in the atmosphere, and it would have spread all across the globe, you would have experienced slightly cooler temperatures and a dramatic reduction of sunlight. Basically, they had the opposite of the greenhouse effect, where now this stuff yep. was being put into the atmosphere and was not letting any new sunlight in instead of trapping it. Yep. And significant drops. Not only dimension, it, just significant less sunlight. Like, yeah. not only less temperature, but now it's it's darker, so... It's dark. It's always tempting to, to imagine that the tsunamis and the, fl the you know, the, the fiery sky are what causes mass extinction, but they're probably not. Mm -mm. I mean, I, I saw a documentary that had a whole point where it was like, and then the entire surface of the planet was cooked in a firestorm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's not what causes mass extinction. No. What causes mass extinction is when your ecosystem has the bottom pulled out of it. And in this case, darkened skies and colder temperatures are going to create massive problems for plants. Mm-hmm. And this is where those patterns of extinction come in. Plant ecosystems fell apart. Yeah. And everybody suffered for it. Because plant, plants, uh, anyone who's done the basic food web back in school, sun is the yep. source of all our energy, and plants are the base of just about every ecosystem until you get to, like, deep sea vents. <laughs> yeah. Or perhaps those freshwater, yeah. you know, your detritivores. But even then, they're usually eating dead leaves. Yep. But if the plants are dying, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of dead leaves. So it's good for a little bit. <laughs> it's estimated that those dark sulfurous type gases would have lingered in the atmosphere for probably months to years. So this was months to years of lowered sunlight, cooler mm -hmm. temperatures. And then once that finally cleared, what was left, right? So the meteorite and the rocks underneath it would have had lots of that sort of dark gaseous material that mm -hmm. vaporized out of it but the rocks that the asteroid crashed into was a lot of limestone limestone is a carbonate rock right. which means that the gas that that's going to vaporize into the atmosphere is carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and uh pop quiz dear listeners when you inject tons and tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a rapid pace what do you get you should know this has been in your notes recently correct yeah you get global warming yeah Instead of blocking sunlight, it lets sunlight through but traps the radiating heat that bounces back up. So for hundreds to thousands of years following this impact, you would have once that short-term cooling had balanced out, you would likely have seen an increase in global temperatures. Mm -hmm. And there is actually direct evidence from uh, geologic evidence, the chemical evidence, as well as uh, organisms, you know, looking at how faunas reacted, that there was a short-term cooling and a long-term warming at the boundary. Yeah. So this was a rough time yeah. to live through. It'd be like going straight from working inside a freezer to outside on a blacktop in the middle of summer. You're, yep. <laughs> people are going to pass out. <laughs> it's not going to be good. <laughs> I've, I've heard people talk about the, uh, the asteroid impact as a very bad day. Yes. <laughs> which is true. Mm -hmm. But it was also a very bad several millennia. Yeah. This it's... would have, this was a gauntlet of a, apocalyptic effects to survive through. Well, it, it was an event that side effects stretched, you know, for the next, you know, foreseeable future for any of those, any of the life forms around at that time. Yep. Uh, which is significant just the fact that that one thing could now color so much of you know that history yep now there are there are some researchers out there who are of the opinion that those effects are perfectly sufficient yeah that's enough to explain the extinction that that's all you need you that happened all those things are backed up by simul by good models and evidence mm -hmm. what else do you need on the other hand there is a big group of researchers out there that point to the other thing that was happening, and that is the Deccan Trap volcanism. So over in India, there was, at about this time, starting a little bit before the actual boundary, mm -hmm. there was a feature going on that is referred to as a large igneous province, or rather that it created a large igneous province. This is basically stupid, crazy extreme volcanic activity. Yeah, just 
the whenever you see those drawings of dinosaur landscapes and there's always just mm-hmm. constantly volcanoes smoking in the background yeah this time it was <laughs> it would have <laughs> been this like one that. place yes <laughs> yeah we're not talking pinatubo or krakatoa explosive volcanoes Jeez. this is slowly seeping for hundreds of thousands of years just constant activity now uh, provinces like this, ma- major pulses of volcanic activity, have happened a number of times over the last 500 million years or so. Mm-hmm. In fact, there are at somewhere around 16 examples of large igneous province vulca- volcanism, and what some proponents of blaming the, the volcanic activity for the extinction point out is that at least half of them are associated with mass extinctions. Yeah. In fact, four of the big five Mm -hmm. are associated with major volcanic systems. Yeah. But exactly why some of them are related to extinction and why some of them don't seem to be is very unclear. Mm -hmm. In the case of India, the Deccan Traps erupted in several pulses. You know, there's a few dozen different bursts of volcanic activity over hundreds of thousands of years in three main phases, Mm -hmm. and each time it erupted, it erupted thousands to tens of thousands of cubic kilometers of lava. Wow. The lava flows from each period of volcanic bursts are tens to hundreds of meters thick in the rocks that they've left behind. In total... The total amount of igneous rock cooled from these eruptions from start to finish is more than 2,000 meters from top to bottom of cooled lava. Wow. Millions of square kilometers covered by this. This was ridiculously intense volcanic activity. Not only... You know, as as we get into, how does this sort of stuff have far-reaching effects? But it's completely rewriting the local topography. Yeah. Of each of those big pulses. <laughs> yeah. It is just completely etch a sketching everything. Yeah. Went over just and over. It out. So the three main phases. This is an interesting point. With the not, it didn't all happen at the boundary. Mm-hmm. The first phase happened around one hundred fifty thousand years or so before the official extinction boundary. Mm -hmm. The third phase happened a couple hundred thousand years after the extinction boundary. The second phase, which which accounts for something like 80% of the total eruptive volume, Mm -hmm. so it was much, much, much bigger than the other two. The middle phase happens right around that 66 million year mark. Yeah. So it happens right around that time of the extinction and the impact. What's interesting, so the effects of this volcanic activity would have been very similar to what we talked about with the asteroid. Yeah, you're pumping out gases. Gases, um, acidification of water and Mm -hmm. soils. You would have gotten temporary cooling, reduction in sunlight. Lots of CO2 would have caused warming Mm -hmm. episodes over longer periods of time. So... Those evidences of warming and cooling around the boundary, this raises the question of, are those the asteroid? Mm -hmm. Or are those the big pulse, the the second phase of this volcanic activity? What's really intriguing is that there is evidence for various effects, including localized extinctions, around the time of the first phase Mm -hmm. of this volcanism. So there's some evidence that the first smaller phase started having these environmental effects and started causing extinctions, Mm -hmm. which really makes people wonder if the extinction, the main extinction event, sort of where we draw the line for this is where the big thing happened, was that, you know, there's, there's really good reason to think that that could have been related to this massive pulse of volcanism that happened at that time. And that's one of those cool things about what you mentioned is that for many people, the asteroid is completely sufficient in all of its side effects to be a death blow. But the reason there's questioning or debating is not so much because there were people going, 
I don't know. That actually just doesn't convince me. It was that, <laughs> well, wait, wait, what about this thing that yes. was also going on at almost the yeah. exact same time doing very similar horrible things to the environment? Yeah. So we we can't ignore that because that, it, there's two smoking guns. Yeah, one's a lot bigger and flashier than the other one. It's a it's mm-hmm. a handgun and a minigun, but <laughs> there are two smoking guns at the crime scene. And it's interesting because there are people on both extremes. Mm-hmm. There are researchers who say the asteroid – well, basically say, look, several other similar volcanic events are associated with mass extinctions. No other asteroid impacts are associated with mass extinctions. Mm-hmm. You don't need the asteroid impact to explain this. Yeah. The volcanic activity is all you need because it was basically like the effects of the asteroid impact happening several dozen times over an extended period. Yeah, so it's it's basically the question that's getting asked is, was the mass extinction about to happen anyway, and then they got hit by an asteroid? Or were things rough and kind of, you know, just bleh, and then yeah. asteroid came in and that was just too much and that caused right. the extinction was it was it a vul- a volcanism induced extinction plus an asteroid induced extinction mm-hmm. that made they, either one of them would have done it but together it was awful or was one of them just a minor nuisance and it was mostly the extinction caused by the other one and one of the reasons that it's so hard to figure this out is because these events happen so close to each other we can date events at this time to within less than 1% error. Mm-hmm. You know, we can get it down to, you know, 66 point something something millions of years ago, which is really good and really accurate, but that's still tens of thousands of years. Yeah. And as far as we can tell, based on our dating, the second main phase of the volcanic activity and the asteroid impact and the extinction, the main, you know, culmination of the extinction, mm-hmm. happened at about the same time. Yeah. Close enough that we have a lot of trouble resolving the effects, which makes it really hard to say this warming or this extinction was because of this event versus this event. It all kind of, you know, it's bundled together in this relatively short period of time. And it, it's it's one of those things that's also hard because the timing is so perfect. It's it's yep. seemingly so unlikely that you would have horrible volcanism and then a rock from above. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Honestly, that's... When I was doing background research on this and really getting into the volcanism aspect, mm-hmm. it bothers me. Yeah. To a core, to the down to the core, because I, as a scientist, I don't like coincidence. Yeah, exactly. It's now one thing that does sort of help out is this volcanic activity. Not only have there been several different instances of this happening, but this was going on for, you know, half a million years or so. Yeah. At least, you know, at least or maybe more. So it's not like they happened on the same day. Yeah, that they started. All at the same time. It was already happening. But it's still, yeah, two things came together. Mm -hmm. Now, to resolve that coincidence, there has been some suggestion Mm -hmm. that the fact that the main phase of the volcanism, the big, big, big eruption period, happened at apparently the same time as the impact might not be a coincidence. Yeah. Um, We know that Seismic activity can affect active volcanoes. Absolutely. And apparently, it has been shown uh, through studies of the Deccan volcanism that the volcanic system of the the Deccan traps shifted around that second phase. Something changed in the fundamental way that the system was working within the magma chamber within the, the whole the volcanic setup. Now, whether or not that was asteroid-induced seismic activity is very, very difficult to say. Yeah, this dang. is not a well-supported theory. Mm-hmm. This is a, a, a hypothesis that people have put out there. Definitely intriguing. 
it was the first idea that came to mind for me yeah. <laughs> when I saw them both. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I wasn't going to blurt it out because I didn't know if people had already shot it down, but it was the first yeah. thought that came to mind. I was like, well, if you have something that's about to pop and you punch it real hard, makes sense. It has been suggested that the volcanism was happening, massive tectonic shifts, mm-hmm. beca- well, at least seismic shifts, because of this asteroid impact could have kicks, you know, given it a kick. Yeah. And sort of caused a little more. Now, again, I don't want to draw too much specific attention to that yeah. because I don't want to portray that like it's a known thing. Yeah, yeah, this is the new idea. It is possible. Yeah. It's being investigated. It's certainly interesting. But it's still mostly up in the air at the moment. And it's going to be really hard to know if yeah. that's the case. So that's where the, the big discussion happens. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things where, as, as you said, Coincidence is something that no scientist is particularly fond of, but it does happen. And yeah. when it does, it makes things really difficult. <laughs> yep. It's it's almost impossible to account for coincidence without just having more times to do it or repeating or you know more yep. data to look at. But there's always and that And that's chance. what makes this so hard. Yeah. Is that there's so few examples of this. Mhm. We don't have a whole lot to compare to. It's not, you know, it. luckily, it's not like we're getting hit by large asteroids all the time. Yes, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing, but if we did get hit a little more often, we'd probably have a clearer answer. This is true. Now, those are the two main things. Asteroid hit, we know that. Volcanic activity, we know that. In the background, mm-hmm. there were some other things going on. So, across the late Cretaceous into the Paleogene, there was an overall drop in sea level. Yeah. And this is one of those things that, you know, a lot of mass extinctions coincide with changes in sea level. And a it's not like the the ecosystems of the Mesozoic had never experienced sea level change before. But what sea level change can do is it changes your coastline. Mm -hmm. It shifts your habitats. It can rearrange ecosystems. And, and can, when ecosystems get rearranged, they get stressed. Absolutely. It can connect ecosystems, which now you have all new neighbors that you may not want. Yep. It can fragment other ecosystems. Mm-hmm. And so there is some suggestion, there is some evidence uh, from various different groups of life in the oceans as well as on land that some ecosystems were disturbed. Yeah in the long term, leading up to this extinction. Perhaps not in a way that, you know, not nothing they couldn't have recovered from, but just, just enough. enough to make them pert- a little bit more vulnerable than they otherwise would have been when these big events came together to strike. And it's one, it's one of those things where this sort of stuff can often end up sounding like, it sure sounds super convenient that... <laughs> Right. This was happening. You know, the water was getting lower and all the animals were thrown off. The volcanoes were going off and then an asteroid came in. That seems a But it's also one of those things to think of the fact that mass extinctions on smaller scales happen all the time in the fossil record. Oh, yeah. Throughout the time of the dinosaurs, there were periods where uh, massive amounts of life at the end of the Triassic. There yeah, was, which is another one of the big five. Yeah, with and that's within the age of reptiles that there was yep. another mass extinction that is notable in size. There were other sizable extinctions of different groups or different types of animals that just petered out or just cut off for sometimes known, sometimes unknown reasons. But these happen all the time, but there's only five big ones. So it stands to reason that something different had to happen for them to be mm-hmm. that sizable. And it makes sense that there's going to be just a, as we mentioned, luck factors in with that, which animals survive. There's also bad luck that caused the mass extinction to begin with. Yeah. In it's, and of the fact this... that an asteroid hit is terrible luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's this, you know, it, it's, 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 it's cool that you bring up that sort of convenience factor. Mm-hmm. The reality is sea level changes all the time. Yeah. Climate shifts happen all the time for all sorts of reasons. And extinctions follow when major changes happen. Absolutely. Extinctions like this, at this scale, are probably going to happen when you get a handful of different effects 
happening at the same time. That perfect storm. Right? They're always going on. Things are always happening. Every now and then they line up mm -hmm. just right, and you end up with something really devastating. Well, it's, it's that concept of, like, if you had a dozen people all just drumming randomly, if they can do it for as long, if they're all immortals... <laughs> and they're yeah. all just drumming at a. Each has cho chosen a different random pattern. At some mm -hmm. point, they'll all sync. Just statistically yeah. speaking, you'll get some moments. Is a is a matter of frequency. And so, at some point, all the bad stuff is going to happen at the same time, as yeah. long as time keeps moving forward. <laughs> yeah. And in this case, we're only talking about three things. Yeah. You know, three major things, along with perhaps some others. One of the big questions that comes up a lot, and I do want to address this, is this question of, were the dinosaurs on the way out? Because mm -hmm. this comes up all the time, and you'll yeah. see people who put forth evidence that, well, dinosaurs were already suffering, and they were already declining. And this is interesting, because there is some evidence that dinosaur ecosystems weren't doing quite as well. Mm -hmm. That diversity was down, that uh, there was less differentiation between different ecosystems in different places. Mm -hmm. There was a study that just came out recently that found that speciation rates had been low throughout and the slowed. Cretaceous. But at the same time, there's evidence, uh, especially for certain groups like uh, uh, the horn dinosaurs, the ceratopsians, and the hadrosaurs, the duckbills, were actually doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that they were doing, you know, they were experiencing high diversity or yeah. high speciation. And the reality is, as far as we can tell, dinosaurs may have not been quite as diverse or quite as stable in the late Cretaceous as maybe, you know, the late Jurassic. If this had happened in the late Jurassic, maybe the effects would have been different. Yeah. But they were still by far the dominant organisms mm -hmm. on the planet. They were, there doesn't seem to be evidence to indicate that they were going to go extinct anyway. Exactly. Because even if they were having a dip in diversity or success or, you know, mm -hmm. stability, that doesn't mean it was just going to be a continual downhill. That happens in populations and in clades all the time where you'll see animals were really common. They, a lot of them, you know, they just started doing really poorly at this time. And then now they're fine again. You know, yeah. just something happened. They weren't doing as well as they used to, but they bounce back. You know, not saying that yep. was what going to happen, but it definitely isn't saying that they were peering out. And this gets into the real complications of trying to explain a mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Anytime, and this I'm sure will come up over and over again in future discussions, whenever that something big happens, people, you know, we want a nice, simple, one clean explanation. Yeah. And there isn't one. In this case, there were a few different factors, and it also depends on what, you know, timing matters. If this mm -hmm. had happened in the Jurassic, yeah, would it have hit as hard? Were habitats and ecosystems more vulnerable now than before? And that's very difficult to say. You know, if an asteroid hit today, would it have a similar effect? There's also even discussion, uh, I've seen this discussion with the volcanic activity, Asking the question of, because different mass extinctions associated with large igneous province volcanism, the size of the volcanic eruptions doesn't seem to correlate with the size of the extinctions. Yeah, the intensity. So I've seen some people question if the location on the planet matters. Oh. Or if the time, you know, if if where was the climate at that time? Yeah. Was it, you know, if the asteroid hits in winter, is it worse than if it hits in summer? You know, yeah. there's so we many a, factors. A hotter ecosystem, you know, to a global temperatures are higher or lower can completely, because it's, you know, if the, uh, if it's temperatures are already in one extreme or the other, temperature change may have more or less effect. Yep. And it's... So it's, it's really, really tough to mm -hmm. know the specifics. And that... What we can say is... This was a major extinction. Mm -hmm. It coincided with a devastating asteroid impact. It coincided with biblical scale volcanic activity. Yeah. And it happened on a backdrop of all sorts of other environmental changes. 
and it and it had an effect. Yeah, <laughs> a big one. That really is uh one of the cores of science in general is there's almost never a clean answer. Yep. You can usually get a two or three sentence answer. But if you ask the person who actually answered the question, the one who actually did the research and did that study, (laughs) their answer is always going to be much more because they know the actual details. They know the actual things of like, well, yes, that is true, but also, and that's, that's just the case with anything in general, but especially in the sciences, there's almost always more because systems are very complicated. Yeah, it, we, we always like to think and portray scientific debates as one person says, I think this, and all the evidence says this, mm-hmm. and I'm not wavering, but that's not most of the time true. No. If you talk to, they'll say, well, our results indicate this, I think that this is a good explanation, but I've read those other 20 studies that, that question that, and that mm-hmm. suggest something different, and they have good points too. Well, and it's, it's, there's know, not, there's, there isn't debate. Unless the evidence isn't a hundred percent clear. Yeah, unless there's a reason for a debate. Uh, and that's the other thing that gets glossed over is even people who are debating about this subject agree on ninety yes. percent of <laughs> what went on with it. It's this one issue that they yep. are having a disagreement on uh, and having to discuss. Everything else they're fine with because. That there's not issues with that. There's not conflict in what the data is showing. You know, yep. that's debates aren't just there where this one scientist says this, this other scientist say that. They also disagree on string theory. They also disagree on which was better, the prequels or the original trilogy. They also <laughs> disagree. It's <Right. laughs> they, yep. they're in line on most everything. It's just this one issue where there is a reason to be unsure because yep. there's either answers on both sides or not enough answers. And this is why it's so difficult, because like I said before, people, you know, there's still seem, there is still this wide perception that this is a huge debate and we have no idea what's going on, because you'll see people do that. They'll say, why do you think the dinosaurs went extinct? Yes. What's your hypothesis? It's like, and I want, <laughs> like, you don't need to do that. Yeah. We have tons of information and the debate isn't a yes or no thing. There's there's tons of information here mm-hmm. that that people are are have been working for decades to sift through, and, and we know it's incredible how much we know about these events. And the the debating process is part of finding that answer. Uh, that's also yes. what gets glossed over is the fact that it, it's often portrayed that there's two sides of the coin and they both hate each other and they're both arguing and eventually it will lay flat on one side and yep, somebody wins. We have a win. It's heads or tails. Eventually the spinning coin will fall on one of those. And that's, that's often not the case to where yeah. the debates persist. We make more discoveries and eventually figure out it's like, all right, you were about 60% right. I was about 40% right. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, it it's both are still going to be in the textbook because neither was just wrong. Neither one just made up a thing to argue about. Both are legitimate, just where's the detail? Where's the line? Where are we going to draw that? Here's where the answer is, is what the debate is. This is an extraordinarily interesting subject. Uh, Before we wrap up, I do want to hit this last point real quick. Yes. Don't have to spend a lot of time on it. After the extinction. Mm Mm-hmm. Basically, extinction happens. Lots of things died. It's not like once the dust clears... Everything is fine. Yeah, it just goes back to normal. (laughs) This event left ecosystems dramatically unstable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not only had many things gone extinct, plants suffered. You know, as much as this wasn't a dinosaur-specific extinction, the fact that you lost dinosaurs is a big deal. Those were a huge, huge part of, of global ecosystems. Absolutely. The evidence indicates that for a long time into the Paleocene, the first epoch of the Paleogene period, just after, starts at the end of the Cretaceous, there was low diversity across many ecosystems. Organisms were small. Organisms were generalists, right? You Mm -hmm. have your animals that are eating whatever they can find. What's really interesting is, especially across North America, which is where most of our KPG 
data comes from, mm -hmm. there's evidence that different ecosystems responded differently and that you had decoupling of relationships between certain groups. Yeah. So specifically, there are some studies on plants and insects, oh. uh, a lot of which are done by an old professor of mine, Peter Wilf, that looked at, basically, you have lots of herbivorous insects. Mm-hmm. And you have lots of plants, mm -hmm. and when the diversity of one is high, the diversity of the other tends to be high. Exactly. Going into the Paleocene, there were at least a couple of ecosystems where this was no longer the case, where you had high diversity of plants but low diversity of insects or vice versa. Your ecosystems broke. Yeah. Tr normal trends in healthy ecosystems fell apart. Balance is off. Yeah, the, the, it was a, just a huge wrench into global ecosystem dynamics and it took millions of years to recover from that. Absolutely. And and also just to to put out there really quick, when we're saying healthy ecosystems, it's the stability of an ecosystem is what allows for diversity and specialization. When you have yep. a ecosystem like this where everything has suddenly been changed, nothing is uh, the way it was or things could change rapidly is also what an unstable system means is if something, you know, stable systems can survive and weather changes because they are stable enough and they have enough things in place that even if something changes for a little while, there's enough in there to keep it together. And because right. of that, all the animals are just having to scrape by. They're just having right. to survive without, they can't go, I'm just going to drink the nectar of this one kind of flower. Because yes. that flower might die out in a year because there's a weird cold snap and it just wipes all that plant out. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough of it or enough places for it to survive to where it can survive, you know, weather that change. Yeah. The more pieces there are in your food web, the less of a big deal it is if you lose one. Mm -hmm. In low diversity ecosystems, you know, a little push will knock you over the edge again. Yeah. And what's really significant to note is that after the main pulse of volcanic activity and after the ex uh, the asteroid impact, sea levels continued to drop. Mm -hmm. The third phase of volcanism was still going to happen. Yeah. You still had your long-term warming following these events. You know, these this was in a difficult world to survive in for a long time following this event. Yeah, it was... It, it completely redefined what life was having to do for quite a while. Uh, yeah. Once things stabilize, you get some cool stuff where animals now, we mentioned this in the snake episodes, where animals start trying to fill in those niches that are now open. The big predatory birds, yep. lots of weird mammals popping up, and lots of stuff like that. But before that stability set in, it was, it was rough. Yeah. And it did it did pave the path for a change in global ecosystem regimes, mm -hmm. right? Some things kind of bounce back. You know, certain groups of organisms like a lot of amphibians, uh, a lot of reptiles, some groups of fish, kind of you know they experienced extinctions and then they kind of came back. Yeah, you know, they weren't like, oh, the that same. Sucked. And then, but it was doing similar things. You know, corals experienced major extinctions here. But then coral reefs rebounded. Mm -hmm. But on land, where you had lost the dominant large-bodied organisms, your dinosaurs and your pterosaurs, those were gone now. Mm -hmm. And so this paved the way for what would eventually become the age of mammals. It'd be very much like in a large corporate situation if the CEO and all the managers left. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It would There's be, gonna be some some changes around here. It would be chaos <laughs> for yep. the first few months as everyone tried to figure out what to do, and then people would start promoting themselves. Yes. And eventually, <laughs> you would have a new business. <laughs> yeah, like hire replacements and bring it in. Yeah. And that's pretty much what happened. Absolutely. That's what the early. Now, having said all that, it's not like the earliest Paleocene was an apocalyptic. Wasteland. No, I mean they they all drove around cars with spikes on it, and you know, yeah, exactly. They were they all loud music. wearing metal face masks, and <laughs> <laughs> some of them established a a system where everybody was trapped in a computer simulation <laughs> of the world. 
This little man was a witness me, witness me. <laughs> uh, there are some really fascinating earliest Paleocene, early Paleocene, early Paleogene ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like everything was terrible. Yeah, but it was it was a long unstable time. It's one of those where if you were to be able to pop back to it, it probably would look healthy and fine. But when you compare it to times of stability and diversity, it is a noticeable step down. Yep. It wouldn't have looked sickly. The animals weren't all walking around going, <coughs> and just wheezing and showing their Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The ecosystems were still functioning. It was just much le lower level of everything, diversity and stability, than it has been and can be. Yep. So there you go. Yeah. The KPG mass extinction. It's It's... It's a cool one, and it's so thoroughly studied that we, new little tidbits keep coming up. Oh, yeah. This is another one. We we say this, at, it feels like we say this at the end of every episode, but it goes extra for this one. Mm -hmm. We could do years worth oh, of yeah. podcast material just on this topic. This could be the KPG <laughs> Extinction Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We, and it's it's crazy how much goes into it the mathematics of the after effect of the immediate after effect of the impact are crazy yep. the ecosystem effects you could talk about each individual group of or animals and mm -hmm. how our understanding of their survival you why know. did this one do better why didn't that one that's all that's a one of the yeah. biggest questions of why did you know crocodilians do fine but the other you know aquatic reptiles didn't you know yep. so on and now, so forth that's an interesting point because I want to. I just want to throw this yeah. one out there real quick before we finish. There was a study that I found uh, recently that looked at crocodilomorphs in Europe. Most of our evidence for the KPG comes from North America, mm -hmm. and across North America, it looks like crocodilomorphs did pretty well. You know, did yeah, comparatively. You know, what did pretty well in Europe? Preliminary analysis indicates that they didn't do very well. Oh. That there were major losses, and one of the explanations that those authors put forward, you ready for a full circle? Yeah. Is because, possibly, during the late Cretaceous, Europe was composed of lots of islands. Oh. And as we discussed last episode, island ecosystems are less, are, are more fragile. Yeah. So that might be a reason why you had a different effect on one continent versus another. Interesting. Remember when I said we could talk about this for years? Yes. <laughs> All the nuances? Yeah. It's... That's fantastic. There's so much to this. So if you're out there and you're listening and you know anything about this extinction event, I want to apologize for not mentioning that one thing you were hoping we would mention. Yeah, we meant to get to Because I know it. we... There's to everyone, so much here. We meant to get to it. We had it written down. We ran out of time. Just that one <laughs> yeah. specific one you were thinking of, it's on the list right here. It's right here. I have it right in front of me. <laughs> Just time constraints. <laughs> On our infinite sheet of paper. Um, we will I will probably come back to this. This will definitely be mentioned. But I would love I to do one going on the other four of the big yes. five. It would In be fun to go through. We could do even the minor ones. Mm -hmm. There's been tons of mass extinctions out there. Yeah, it's, and it's a statistic that makes sense once you think about how long life has been around. But the vast majority of life on Earth is extinct. Oh yeah, gone. <laughs> most of the things that have lived on Earth are now extinct. Yep. And it's a common thing that happens all the time. Yep. So it, there's a lot there to talk about. Yeah. This topic seems like a great one to make sure we mention here at the end of the episode. If you have follow-up questions, let us know. Please do. If you, if you want to hear about another major extinction event or if there's a segment of this that you you should have done a whole episode about that mm -hmm. let us know yeah we will absolutely talk more about this as we said before we we can come up with episode ideas till till our faces are blue and our typing hands are sore but yep. it's it'll be a lot more fun if we know we're talking about something you want to hear about yep so big thank you to all those people who have started uh, following us on twitter facebook Truly. podbean we've gotten some contact yeah. Uh, some contact with the outside world. It's proof that we're not alone. With the creatures known as the audience. <laughs> They're out there. Uh, we have, we I have a poster that says, I want to believe on my wall, <laughs> just so everyone knows. 
<laughs> I've just, heard legends. It's of just these. a picture of a a person Jesus. wearing headphones, uh, <laughs> in their car, just driving, listening to the podcast. Don't wear headphones in your car. Yeah, that's no, not what you I mean. have to have at least one ear open. I was told that by a cop. Uh, I don't know if that's in different states. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna stop giving legal We're advice. Gonna get sued. I'm I'm gonna don't. stop giving legal advice. I'm a paleontologist. <laughs> if you're listening to my legal advice, though, that's really on you. <laughs> that is yeah, your mistake. This, this podcast is not intended as legal advice. Yeah, there's the nowhere did it say common assent and traffic traffic laws. <laughs> this seems like a good time to cut ourselves <laughs> as off. As they would say on Top Gear and on that on that uh bomb. <laughs> <laughs> good night everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time.